everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Library Love Fest Door to Door series. We are over the moon about uh, the guests that we have on our episode today. We have blockbuster authors, beloved authors, Susan Elizabeth Phillips and Sarah McLean, and their editor, executive editor, Carrie Ferron, who is the executive editor at William Morrow and Avon Books. And of course, you have, you know us, we're old shoes at this point. Chris, <laughs> Laney, and I are so happy to be here with all of you. And we are so thrilled to have these two authors with us and Carrie. So, ah, uh, hello, ladies. How are you all? Good. Hi. Great. Happy here. Um, I think we should go around and say where you all are hailing from. Susan, where are you? You're in the tropics. You're like Chris. <laughs> the military's flying over. Um, I am coming to Right you. on time. I know, I know. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, sunny Carlsbad, California, uh, near San Diego. And every once in a while, you San Diego people will recognize when the coaster goes by. It's not that far away. And that was probably a helicopter from Camp Pendleton. So instead of being home in Chicago, Mr. Bill and I are sequestering out here. We miss everybody at home, but we certainly are enjoying our time here. Mm, I love the reflection of the palm trees and the glass behind Isn't you. Is that cool? Yes, it's lovely. It's lovely. Sarah, where are you? I I'm in Brooklyn, New York, in New York City. Um, so we've been, I have a calendar. I feel like I, I'm keeping good track. It's day 46 of our quarantine in our house. Um, so it's really nice to see you guys. <laughs> I was talking this morning to somebody and saying like, I miss saying hello to, to strangers in stores. Like I miss the back and forth with people who are selling me milk and you know other things because we're not getting any of that. So it's nice to see you. You know what I'm missing? Thanks for having me. I love, I mean, I'm missing smiling at people and having them smile back. Yes. I'm just making yes. it. Yes. And you know, Tara Banks does the whole smiling with your eye thing. I try, but I just look at the shortage. No, that's what I was saying is I, I feel it's probably not a whole lot of surprise to the people on this grid that I am an extrovert. Um, but I've always sort of thought that this was sort of not a kind of nonsense way of thinking about your identity. But I really now understand that like I'm thirsty for strangers to like look me in the eye, which who knows what I mean. I know. It could just be ego. <laughs> oh, no, I don't think that's ego. I think it's a need to connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a need to connect. I don't know. I. You know, we're all sort of, you know, just, you know, these are very, very strange, very strange times and uncharted waters. And uh, and I think librarians, you know, we're, we're in touch with librarians who are all logging on and watching. And I think, you know, they, they're they not connecting either. You know, they're the ones who are on the front lines and, and they're so used to that, you know, that service that they provide. And, and, uh, and so, and they are still providing it just virtually, which is wonderful and leave it to librarians to figure it out in two set shakes of a lamb's tail how to do that because they're the smarty pants of the world. Virginia, yesterday we had a little rehearsal just to make sure we had um, all the technicalities taken care of. And Virginia started talking about librarians and what you're all going through right now. And she spoke, you were speaking so passionately. I actually thought you were gonna break into tears and I, wrote down one of the things you said yesterday. You said librarians are all heart. <laughs> I just love that because it's so true. There might be a few exceptions, but in general, all heart. <laughs> well, I, I thank you. I appreciate your uh, jotting that down. And I'm and, I, and but, I, but it's true. You know, I mean, look, we've all been doing this a long time and we know that that's true. We know that, you know, librarians are, um, loyal readers and uh they're loyal to authors once they once they start that's it you can count on them for lifers you know because they're um they they know good stuff when they read it and they're just and they are they are essential workers um and and they're essential to all of us to to publishers to writers to readers i mean they are you know and everything that they're providing the services that they're pro 
providing virtually. If you go to any library website and you'll see information up there, you can even get your, if there are people out there who haven't, don't have a library card, you can get it online now. You know, you can, that's mm -hmm. like, they're there for you. So, so anyway. I can confirm that my library card, my New York, New York public library card expired uh, in January and I had a book due. Uh, so I didn't know it expired until uh, we were quarantined and I wanted to take books out of the library and I panicked and went to Twitter with panic <laughs> and New York and New York City, they figure they they have a system to get me a new library card. It was fantastic. And I'm back in business. Thank God. Yeah. What would I do? What would any what of you do? owe? <laughs> would you, Sorry. What, what'd you say? <laughs> and how much do you owe? <laughs> how much do you owe? Mm. Is there any way we can? <laughs> Uh, fun fact, I, we were cleaning my daughter's room and we found a library book that had gone missing two years ago, like behind a bookshelf. And, um, but we had paid, I had, I'm, I'm a good citizen. I'm a good library citizen. I had called and told them that it was lost and paid my bill. So, but nice. it's here now. And it was like a miracle. We found it and now she's thrilled. She has a new princess book to read. So <laughs> that's great. That's great. So Carrie, um, you know, this is so wonderful that uh, we have you here um, to, as the editor of many books over many years in HarperCollins, uh, William Morrow, but to, to have your two star authors here talking to librarians, I just think this is a unique opportunity for this really cool conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm just gonna turn it over to you because I think it would be fun to hear from your point of view, um, how, you know, what your relationship is like uh, with, with Sarah and with Susan, and especially for these two new books that we we're gonna get to. Oh, wait a minute, before you say a word, Carrie, remember that this is your time to talk about how fabulous and cooperative Sarah and I are, okay? Just <laughs> Very clever, always on time. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> Being home has not been horrible for me, but I, I'm <laughs> spend time with you guys here, especially, I mean, Susan and I have worked together for 26 years. 26 years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember our, before you had your first child, I, we were together. Yep. And I mesmerized Sarah into writing for Avon by apparently having the right painting in my office. Was it a painting? <laughs> Poster. It was a cover. It was the cover of Jude Devereaux's The Black Lion. And I felt like, I mean, I was like, well, obviously I have to go and write for her because that's, <laughs> that's the beginning. That's my beginning. So I think the, for me, the best thing about publishing um, is working with people that you know you can work with for a long time because they have great energy and you feel that energy when they when they write and you know that they're dedicated to what they do and, and they're gonna go on for years and years. And I love to see careers grow just like librarians love to see the bookshelves grow of backlist. Um, but I think that these two extroverts really should spend most of the time talking because uh, I think they're a lot more interesting to, than I am. And I will, uh, I will let you go. Sarah, do you wanna go first? Um, yeah, I have to say, I don't think that the three of us have ever been together on a in a panel situation like this or in a situation like this, a conversation like this. And certainly we've never done that with me at my desk. And I just want to share with everybody that, um, you know, aside, aside from I'm, I'm not a very neat, uh, I'm not, I don't have a very neat desk. I have a stack of, of index cards on my desk that have like inspirational thoughts and quotes that I use to remind me of what I'm doing every day when I'm writing um, because writing for me is a lot about just sort of wandering around in the darkness and I'm very excited to be able to share with you guys that these two people Carrie and Susan have key key cards on my desk that sit right on their taped to my monitor most of the time and the first is when I started, when I signed with um, with Avon, when I started to, be, to publish with Avon in 2009, I asked Carrie, you know, what's the thing? What's the thing that you look for? 
um, when you're looking for a book um, because I had written the first book <laughs> and then I had to write another one and I didn't know how you write another book. I had written the only book that I thought I could write. Um, and she said, there are three things I look for and they are character, conflict and voice. And I literally look at this card every day when I sit at my desk. I'm like, okay, who are, who are my characters? What is the conflict? And how do I write forward? And then um, the other is a classic SCP quote, which just says, keep the reader in the story. And I spend so much time thinking, you know, what would Susan do? WWSD. <laughs> so, um, so, and part of that is because I come to, I come to romance the same way so many romance, so many librarians come to romance and that's just as a reader. Um, I started reading romance when I was a baby. Um, my local library, I will tell a library story, um, which is that my local library, which is li the Lincoln Public Library in Lincoln, Rhode Island, um, was next door to my middle school. And on days when I was, you know, late, late home from school or I, stayed late at school, I would walk over to the library and my mom would pick me up there. And I discovered romance novels there in the fifth or sixth grade um, because they kept all the romance in the corridors of the library, in the aisles of the library that the lights were off in. So I was like, what's going on in these dark corridors? And I turned on the lights and what was going on there was Susan Elizabeth Phillips. And I was like, done, I'm, I'm done forever. Um, so for me, as a reader, I have spent so much time learning um, and learn and loving romance novels. Um, and part of the reason, and I'm always just pinching myself every time I'm on a, I, I sit with Susan because she teaches me something every time. Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I want you to talk a little bit because I want to know more about your Bare Knuckle Bastard series. <laughs> Oh, right. I write, I wrote a book too. Um, <laughs> and I my... also, when you answer that, so I got on your website and this is what I found. I love this. Why didn't somebody ever say this about me? Described, <laughs> I think by Entertainment Weekly, the elegantly fuming, yeah. utterly intoxicating queen of historical romance. <laughs> Baby. Well, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're just not angry enough. <laughs> but will you? Where did they? Where did they get that? And how does that relate to your new series? Well, it's not a new series. You've got the last book coming out. Yeah, right. It's book three. Um. So, um, <laughs> I am. Uh. I get. I get real mad about a lot of stuff online. If anybody has followed me online, they know that. Um, and I, I think that that particular, I think the elegantly fuming part always refers to my diehard defense of romance as a genre. Um, romance as feminist literature, romance as a place where we can talk about hope and we can talk about happily ever after. And it's not an unrealistic expectation for women and marginalized people to find um, hope and happy, happily ever after in their lives. And so the books, why shouldn't books exist to show that um, and to show that truth. And um, also, and because of that, I think my in, intense passion for that as a theme of my work and my life and these books that I love so much, um, it, that gets into every one of my books. And so right now I'm writing a series called The Bare Knuckle Bastards, or I'm finished with a series called The Bare Knuckle Bastards. The last book is out in June. It's called Daring and the Duke. Uh, but it's about three, it's about four children who are raised together in a situation um, that is almost untenable. There's kind of a villainous father figure um, and three boys who are made to fight in a kind of Hunger Gamesy style for to inherit a dukedom, and the girl who um, is not their sister but who lives on the estate with them when they are children, and um, ultimately one becomes duke and the others escape and they end up living in Covent Garden, in a kind of um, in a community that is Covent Garden is not fancy. It is not what it looks like now if you've been to London and and spent time there. It's um, 
dirty and it's very work it's filled with uh it's very working class there's a lot of poverty there um but none of that is one none of that um impacts the fact that so many of the people who live and work there were noble right i wanted to write a, a series about noble characters who weren't nobility um and who fall in love and they're criminals, there's a sort of underground crime element, they're smugglers, they're bare knuckle fighters, they, um, they're they not afraid to, to get dirty um, in all ways. <laughs> and, uh, and so what I did was I built this sort of really, what I hope readers love, readers feel is, is a real cinematic world where there are a lot of dark corners and dark people who, also, who are sort of noble scoundrels. I love a noble scoundrel. So, you know, sue me. It, it also had to create the women that were the men for these men. Yeah, I mean, of course, right? Because when you have men who are, who have had to sort of really pull themselves up out of the gutter to make themselves kings, um, they need, they each need their, their match. Um, and so that's what's happened. And this final book is really a, a match for the ages. They are they are equally strong. They are both. She Grace, the heroine, is a bare knuckle fighter herself, um, and the hero is, of course, the, the 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 son who or the brother who inherited the dukedom, and they have to fight it out. Enemies to lovers in like Sarah, the purest form. Yes, Sarah. If you had to give the log line for this book, what would it be? This particular book what's, cannot. <laughs> what's that book? Um, it's for romance lovers. The logline is it is, uh, it is an immense grovel novel. There is he has a lot to atone for, and if you like men in pain, this is your book. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it's, I mean, I, I mean, I, I've described to everybody as a book that's really, it's, in, it's, it's an intense novel about, about two people who cannot help but be desperately in love with each other. And, and also, you know, with a girl gang. <laughs> I have a comment that says, yes, the grovel. <laughs> <laughs> so successful with readers. I know my readers are loving it. I hear about it on my Facebook page all the time. Bravo, indeed. Thank Susan, you. you have a book coming too. And it's the first one in a while. Yay. Yes, that could be. Um, I have, uh, it's been about three years or four years or, you know, who's counting between <laughs> books and Dance Away With Me is a single title book. And, you know, I kind of like to sort of um, alternate my uh, more romantic comedies with these standalone books. This is the story of um, Tess. She is a midwife, the heroine, and she's also a deeply grieving young widow who's tried to isolate herself in this remote cabin above the town of Tempest, Tennessee. The hero is a former street artist. He's distant, he's enigmatic, all he wants, the best kind of hero, all he wants is to be left alone. Needless to say, that is not gonna be happening, especially in this town, which is very suspicious of outsiders. So with Dance Away With Me, it's one of those books I love to write and I love to read. It sort of straddles that line between romance and women's fiction. It's about um, community. It's about um, family, how families are made. And of course it has a solid romance at its center. So I'm really happy to have, finally have this book out and, and uh, let readers come on, it, on this journey with me. I, I think it's going to, um, I, I think they're gonna like it. I hope they do. And um, I'm just really excited to have it finally out. You have so many people that have asked for um, an early copy of this book. Uh, <laughs> now that I'm in quarantine, you know, probably 80 miles away from my office, no chance I can send it to anyone. <laughs> I already have it. <laughs> <laughs> one copy, one advanced copy. 
Well, they're available as e-galleys uh, on Edelweiss, so go there. Yes. I have a question. I have I have questions, but I know Susan, you want you're gonna read. So I'm gonna hold my questions until after. I was just gonna read a page or so from the beginning of the book, just because I like to read. And there's a camera in front of me, so why not, right? <laughs> so this is our introduction to the heroine. Tess danced in the rain. She danced in her underpants and an old tank top with her feet tucked into a sad pair of once silver ballet flats. She stomped her feet on the slippery moss-covered flagstones under the dripping hickory tree that had sheltered the mountain cabin for so many years. Today, she danced to hip hop. Yesterday, it was reggae. The day before that, maybe grunge, maybe not. As long as it was loud, loud enough to be an accomplice to her anger, to sanctify the grief that would never, ever go away. The kind of loud that wasn't possible in Milwaukee, but here on Runaway Mountain, where her nearest neighbors were deer and raccoon, she could blast her music as loud as she needed. The cold, wet wind of an East Tennessee February carried the scent of decaying leaves and skunk. This wasn't the right weather to be outside in only a tank top and underpants. But unlike a dead husband, being wet and cold was something Tess could fix. A broken flagstone caught the toe of her ballet flat, sending it flopping into the weeds, one shoe on, one shoe off, sending all her emotions into her feet. A sharp stone dug at her heel, but if she stopped, her anger would burn her up. She forced her hips to move, tossed her head so that her wet, tangled hair flew, Faster and faster. Don't stop. Don't ever stop. Once you stop, and we stop. <laughs> That's the moment when our very irritated hero or anti-hero enters the book. It's a lot of fun. So, but here's my okay. here's my question about your about your books. Um, because I I you and I did a panel a couple of nights ago, actually, last week maybe, and we talked about tropes. And I love the runaway sort of fish out of water trope and you do too. And I wonder if you could talk a little about so many of my favorites of your books are about women who are without country almost and have to sort of refine themselves and rebuild themselves. Um, and can you talk a little bit about where that comes from? And, you know, you're from Chicago, like it's always small, like in the mountains, in the small town. Tell me, tell us about that. Jennifer Cruzy used to get in my face. She said, you torture your heroines. But I love that from the time I read The Boxcar Children when I was a kid, I love taking uh, the heroine and removing her support structure. Uh, it, putting her where it's only her wits that are going to help her survive. It's like the ultimate survival story to me. Uh, the Fish Out of Water, of course, the classic one of my books is uh, Phoebe Somerville. The, um, the woman who knows nothing about football and inherits a professional football team in um, It Had to Be You. It's a story that I cannot hear enough. And I love, well, how many stories begin with a stranger comes to town? That's, that is the trope I'm sort of working with. And I especially love hitting a heroine who doesn't have a lot of resources against a hero who has many resources. I love that kind of internal churn you get between those characters. It's one of my favorite, favorite things to read because for that heroine to match up and go against that hero because he is so strong and he has so many things going for him. He's usually wealthy, she's not. I mean, there's so many disparities between them. She really has to find her strength. Um, and because I'm a little older than you, Sarah, just a couple of years, I remember growing up during this time when just being a woman meant you didn't have to have, you didn't have rights. I remember interviewing at one point for a job with Ohio Bell, where I had to tell them who my boyfriend was, where he worked, whether we were going to get married. And I also remember, and here's a story, I, here's a story on Mr. Bill. So it took him longer. Like to get hot with anger. Oh, oh, I know. I know. <laughs> right? 
So, um, Mr. Bill was in engineering school. It was a five-year program. He had to drop out for a year to work on a garbage truck uh, to make money. So he was in school and had more debt than I had. I started working earlier than he did. I had my little department store credit card. I had always paid my bills. He was in debt. He'd never had the credit card. When we got married, I had to move my credit card into his name. It had to be Mrs. William Phillips. So those are stories. I mean, it's my past and when I grew up and a lot of women my age can identify with that. Oh, mm -hmm. here's my inside salute to Chicago. The rest of you can ignore it. Where's Lori Lightfoot, right? <laughs> can you hold that up to the camera? It won't mean anything to a lot of you, but it will mean something to some of you. <laughs> okay. I'm sort of interested what's in that cup. <laughs> Not telling. Okay. <laughs> Clear liquid. Clear liquid. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, we're so excited about both of these books. Susan, you, um, well, Sarah's book, your, your book is just up now on NetGalley. So, um, reviews yes. yesterday. In. Yeah. And Susan's, yours, yours were up there and um, you've gotten starred reviews from PW and Booklist. Um, I, I love both of these quotes, but I think I want to read the PW one because I want you to talk about this a second. A deeply felt romance, Philip Lay Phillips layers this poignant love story with robust descriptions of mountain scenery and society in a well-handed subplot about Tessa's fight for comprehensive sex education for the town's teens. This starring romance is sure to capture readers' hearts. Um, and of course, PW giving the star review calls it a superbly written standalone flair for highly imaginative plots. I mean, there's just love for you guys all over the place. Um, but did you want to talk about the plot just a little bit more about Tess and her fight for uh, comprehensive sex ed in the town? I want to talk about it it's on the page. In the book, I'm not talking about it. Really? Okay. Sarah. Over to you, Sarah. I'm for sex ed. I'm for comprehensive sex ed. <laughs> so, hey, let's I, do it. Um, can I, <laughs> this is a question that continues to fascinate me, and I'm always asking her about this. Uh -huh. um, it has it, that, nothing to do with Sarah or me, but you've been, you, you have been, you worked your way up from the very bottom of the ray of the ladder. You've had a lot of books cross your desk. What makes you buy a book and what makes you pass on a book is it instinctive are you picking off an internal list it's it's kind of the same thing that makes you keep reading a novel or put it aside um do, you know does it have a a voicey opening like does it have um is it a peek into a world that i'll never experience myself um i love that can you surprise me in the plot? Because that's really hard because I've read a lot of books by now as, as fall readers, actually. Um, you know, what about you is different? What about this writer is different? I, I think all those things um, hit my mind, but I think it's the same way that, that you pick a book. Um, the truth is I have, I read a lot of things that will never be published by, you know, Avon or William Morrow. And so readers actually have more choices than I do. So I, I really know when a book hits me as something that we should publish. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a lot of writers now. So my biggest regret is that I don't have more new writers to work with. Like I, I just probably should have more, more on my plate than I do. I, but, you do not need any more on your plate. I testify to this. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a job that I love every day like every single day. I'm happy to do it. I love working with talented people. I mean, how many people can say that? You know, they spend their whole day dealing with creative people. It's, it's really wonderful. And we can all do it at home. Look how well we're thriving now being in quarantine. Like books are still being purchased. Books are still being made. We're still sending things to production. Like, you know, movies have to shut down. There's not gonna be a lot new on Netflix in the next 10 weeks, but what about books? They're, they're still coming. And I think that's very exciting. Yeah, I do too. Um, so what, what, what do you think you'll write about this quarantine? 
either one of you. Will it change anything? Will you ignore it in your next book? You have to um, address it now, right? You have to what? What did I, you say? Well, you don't have to in historicals, but I think in contemporary, and what occurred to me is because I like to take the support system away from my heroines, this is just a perfect way for me to kill off all their, my heroines' parents. You can do it in a sentence. You don't have to do these long, elaborate backstories. <laughs> They're gone. Oh, man. <laughs> but that's just like, yeah. it's a writer's story. Sarah, does it, does it change yeah. your idea of, of how certain things happened in the past? You know, I mean, disease was a lot more prevalent. Will you just really Yeah, but... I'm just I don't know it's hard and I mean for me right for I look as a reader I really well as a writer too I really sympathize with contemporary writers because I think this is a question that contemporary writers are all having to grapple with for me I mean I mean for historical writers plague and sickness and illness is always a possible it's always an easy way to kill off your heroine's parents so um <laughs> And the truth is that, um, you know, we spend so much time, I'm sort of famous for, for creating these, these weird, obscure doctors in the background who like, have funny ideas about medicine, right? That so that you could save a hero who's maybe been stabbed almost to, to death. Um, which happens in nearly all of my books. Um, and so so for me, like the idea of sickness, I mean, we've spent so much time sort of building, I've spent so much time building worlds where like sickness is a, an, an empirical threat that is, you know, how, that is avoided at every turn. Um, but I wonder if actually we're going to start seeing things like, I'm hoping that in romance and women's fiction, we're going to start seeing things like um, sick bed like like caretaking romances um which everybody loves that scene where you know the hero threatens the doctor but you know things where people are are ill i think we're we might start seeing a um, more forced proximity romances you know people who are stuck together i mean i would really re i've never i realized i've never written a snowed in story and i would really like to write a snowed in story now um and then i do think and this one is like it's always it's an it's an evergreen one, but I I will I expect that we will start to see some marriage and trouble romances too because I mean it's hard out here married people. <laughs> Not my marriage. I don't know about you, Sarah. Mine is just <laughs> sure, totally fine. <laughs> yesterday, so she's still together. <laughs> No, um, it's in, in contemporary romance, yeah, it's not, it's not going to be dealing with um, the plague, the sea issue. It's always dealing with those darn cell phones. I, it makes plotting so much harder than in historical romance, although you have your own challenges with costumes and everything else. Um, but, you know. No, but I mean, yeah, I, I, it's amazing. I think the contemporary is so hard to write because of that, because. How, how do you keep two people who don't want to be together together? How do you force them, you know, in a, in a historical, I can say, oops, you're both in the same carriage. Congratulations. It's a week to Scotland. Yeah. You know, but. Well, and in Carter dance away with me. So I did not have to deal with the cell phone thing is they are in on a, in a very isolated area and Wi-Fi comes in and out in that book. And so does that cell phone signal. It just had to be. I love it. I love it. Um, we have some questions. If you guys want to hear from the many people who are watching and loving this, um, I'll start from the bottom because they've just been coming in. So much love. Uh, let's see. We have um, Jess Libris writes, yes to the sickbed scene with a freaking out hero who finally realizes he has feelings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she if she dies you die that's the best line of huh. any hero <laughs> thank you that's validated a t that, that's a t-shirt um I mean, yes 
right now it's not a good uh, doctors are amazing and we shouldn't threaten them but in books it's fine <laughs> okay yeah uh let's see uh, what are your thoughts, and this is for both of you, what are your thoughts on first and third point of view? What is the current trend? Or I suppose it's all, for, all three. I don't write in first person point of view, but I don't mind reading in it at all. A lot of readers will say they hate reading in first person, and then they'll read an amazing book in first person and love it. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. What about you, Sarah? I'm, I also only write in third, um, and I don't have a problem. I mean, I read plenty of books in first person. I just think it's about skill. You know, the, in the hands of a great writer, anything works. Yeah. That's true. I think third person tends to work better in romance, though. It, it, right, it, because you can... It's harder to write in person. Yeah. We had a question yeah, about... Yeah, you don't want to give too much away. And uh, do you know at the beginning where your story's going to go, or do you let your characters take you? <laughs> Carrie, that is so unkind. <laughs> That's oh, really happened. mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, I will get the elephant out of the room. I have no clue. I know the couple's going to end up together. I don't even have a clue what's going to happen at the end of the first chapter, let alone the first book. And I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize for that. Just the way it is. Over to you, Sharon. <laughs> oh, you're so rattled. Um, I have a very weird process that I don't recommend um, to really anyone, but um, my process is that I actually can't start a book unless I know what we refer to as the, the dark moment at the end of the book is. So I have to know what the climactic scene of the book is, the moment where the readers, there's that moment for romance readers always where you think like these two are never, it is over. They are never gonna end up together. And I have to know what happened in that moment for the book. But then it's a little like if I, if you knew where the grocery store was and you had to get there from your house, but all the roads you've ever driven on are no, are out of order <laughs> or out of, or not working. So you have to sort of, it's a lot of like writing into the darkness with an idea of, that's the scene that I need at the end. So there is a scene at the end of Daring in the Duke. So um, the Bare Knuckle Bastard series is, like I said, three books and they're very interconnected. You can read them standalone, all of them, but they're, if you read them in order, there's a lot of joy, I think, for the reader. Mm -hmm. And part of what happened when I was plotting this is I, when I conceived of the whole series, the whole arc of the series, I knew what the last, climactic scene would be in the third book and so the whole series has really been writing towards this scene um and that is true also of those of you who read the casino series that I wrote that's true of that series too I knew what the climactic scene of never judge a lady by her cover would be and then everything was writing toward that I think um that is if you if I ever, get, when I get that, when I know what I'm writing toward, that is a gift. Unfortunately, I don't get it with every book or, yeah. um, I mean, I get it, I get it sooner or later, but uh, sometimes every once in a while I get it early on in the writing process. And that is just a gift from God when you get that. When I don't have that, it's just this continuous slog trying to just see through all this fog to what you want to point. Yeah. To point. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's in the end, it's all, it's, I mean, in the end, both of you do amazing work, you know, whatever process you have just works for you. And it's unique yours. Like, I'm writing that down. Carrie says <laughs> I do amazing work. <laughs> I think that's all the stronger that you can take something and like, find what you're getting at, you know, like that's an even better skill. It depends on, on how your brain is wired, how you approach this whole thing. I mean, there are so many writers who have a very clear outline from the very beginning. And then there are the ones who just work around in the mire. There's no right or wrong way to write a book for sure. Have you ever tried to outline, Susan? Oh, yeah. I wrote and um, <laughs> a big, long outline of Glitter Baby, which is my first big book uh, before I started it. And that book was rejected. And then I just said, well, screw this. I can't outline, but I wrote the book anyway. Thank goodness. <laughs> that broke out my career. But that taught me a big lesson. It's just not anything that I'm going to be able to. Yeah. Do. 
And the final Same. Was nothing like that. It was a waste of three months, total waste. It was a waste of three months for you to write the outline. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because it did not, yeah. it bore no resemblance to the final book. And, mm -hmm. it just and the thing is that when you're writing, actually, I think writing an outline, and I say this all the time, is a false talent. Like what, you know, no, no reader ever sees the outline. So if it works for you to put down two, three pages of just scenes that you think are coming up, you know, that's fine. But how, I never ask for outlines with, um, with books, just ideas, really. Can we talk? Thank God. Yes, thank you. And before we move on, I'm sorry, everyone, I have to dodge over to a webinar. So Susan, Sarah, Carrie, you're all stars. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Bye, I'll watch Chris. Thank the you. rest of the episode later. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Bye, yeah. Chris. <laughs> He's going to another palm tree. He just wanted to get away from having five women around him. Well, now we can get crazy. <laughs> I think now is the perfect time, a perfect segue to talk about, um, well, Susan, I would love for you to talk about your, uh, your writing, uh, your writing classes that you're giving through the library, but, and also since Chris is gone now, we can talk about your number one requir requirement. The first rule of writing, <laughs> take off your bra. <laughs> All those ideas get strangled. You just cannot write in a bra. Um, <laughs> on Friday, I'm doing a workshop with uh, a, a webinar for the Carlsbad Public Library. And I thought this would be a great time because people do, a lot of people have a lot of time on their hands to talk about how to get started on writing that book you've always thought about writing or people who've written a little bit, but they don't know what to do with it. So I'm just going to do a, a general webinar uh, Carlsbad Public Library, and I think it's going to it's going to be on Friday, uh, this coming Friday at noon Pacific time, uh, and I think it's going to be really a fun thing to do. So I'll ramble for a while, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, what what editor Carrie just said about outlining, by the way, and then I'm going to um, answer questions, and we'll just roll it out, see how we see what happens. That's very exciting. That's very it's and. Fun. Yeah. And is that going to be on their Facebook page? We can find out about that because I don't know if other people can log on or not, but we can find out. I forgot to check. I don't know if it is or not. We'll find out and we'll put it on this, on our thing later to let people know. Okay. Um, I'll um, put it on my Facebook page too. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Um, just going back to um, just a few comments. Um, just wanted to let you know again, how much love there is out there from librarians and readers, they're not separate. Um, Wendy Wilson Bartlett with the Cuyahoga Library, love them. Uh, she says, mm, romance and women's fiction will be solid gold for my library customers. Awesome. Thanks. And, and that's an awesome, that's an awesome system. Um, and and uh, Jess Liebers again, there are going to be so many great forced proximity books. People are very much into this. Um, um, let's see. Um, Lainey, do you have some on yours? I just want to make sure we get to everybody. <laughs> yeah, lots of good comments. On the Avon page, we have a lot of people asking what books you're finding comforting right now, what you're reading. Um, I am going back. I, Carrie asked me this. <laughs> Carrie asked me this the other day, and I have been redoing a ton of rereading, which um, I don't usually do a ton of. Um, partially, I I think it's just because I want those kind of, the, I want authors who I'm really deeply committed to and who I know are going to deliver me exactly what I want. So I actually have reread the Chicago, the entire Chicago Star series recently. I did a podcast about Nobody's Baby But Mine, which Anybody who listens to my podcast knows that I'm obsessed with this book. And I think it's like the greatest. It's just the greatest. Susan, you know, I love it. So, um, and then, but I actually just recently, um, I, I reread Cressley Cole's Immortals After Dark series not long ago. I've been doing a lot of um, reading. I've, I reread Lisa Kleypas's, um Wallflower series not long ago. Um, and then I actually just read today, I, I've, I've already read it, um, but today Sophie Jordan has a new book out called The Virgin and the Rogue, which is 
those of you who love old school historicals are going to love this one because it's an aphrodisiac romance, but it's updated for a new generation. Um, the heroine is the heroine's sister is it's historical, and the heroine's sister is um, she is into tinctures and tonics for lady lady ailments, and the hero the heroine has terrible cramps, and so the um, she's her sister makes her a tonic, which is an accidental aphrodisiac. Um, and then there's, but luckily, luckily, there is a single, you know, rogue in the house um, who is, who she stumbles upon in the dead of night. And there is this remarkably sexy, I mean, like on fire sexy scene um, that is, you know, we talk so much about like how we write, how we write old school romance, feel the books that feel like those big romantic old school romances in an age where consent is a constant thought and Sophie just knocks it out of the park that's called the virgin and the rogue and it's out today oh, cool uh, talking I mean Sarah is a romance encyclopedia yeah I cannot I just can't keep up with her but I love she, Sarah, Sarah you have a couple forums where you talk about uh, books in general. Tell everybody about that because everybody may not know about that. Sure. Um, well, I have, like I said, I have a podcast which comes out every Wednesday and uh, it's called Faded Mates and you can find us at fadedmates.net. It started as a, at a, as a read-along podcast last year. The, it was intended to be 18 episodes, one episode each for a deep dive read-along of uh, Cressley Cole's Immortals After Dark series, which I just reference, um, which I think is one of the best romance series ever written. And uh, my friend Jen and I started doing it and then we decided, well, but what if in between episodes, we did a little episode just about tropes and romance that we love. Like what if we did road trip romances or enemies to lovers romances and we just recommended romance novels that we think are great. And then season after 18 episodes or after, you know, 36 episodes, we sort of decided, well, we'll keep going. And now this year we're doing what's called The Books That Blooded Us, which is a deep dive of all the books that taught us what romance novels could be. So it's it's some of it is, you know, this week's episode is about Sandra Brown, which we all read when we were, you know, 12 or 13. But now, um, you know, we're also talking about more modern romances, authors who are newer, who are just teaching us like, how romance can expand its scope and how romance is really more than what we have ever imagined, what, what many of us imagine it to be. So there's that. And then I have a book club online called the, well, it was called the Old School Romance Book Club, which was designed to, again, sort of analyze these old romances and figure out why they make us feel all those feelings they make us feel. Um, and now it's just a place where I think there are 7,000 members now and it's just a place where you can go and talk about the books that you love and meet like-minded people who also want to talk about romance novels. Um, it's just a great way to find community, which even now, you know, especially now, um, finding a community of people who respect and love and honor romance is, hard, is still hard, even now in 2020. So I'm really excited to be a part of it. I'm, I'm reading a lot of nonfiction now and I'm reading, falling in love with some of these books that have been out forever that I'm finally catching up with. Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. I mean, that oh book. My God, best book, best book. So good. And gave it as a gift to um, my teenage grandson. I just think it's one of those books that kids should be reading. Um, educated, mm. got fantastic. Old one, Boys in the Boat. I really enjoyed that. Oh, wow. That's and, and then, like Sarah, I'm going toward the um, the writers that are going to be comfort reads for me in historical romance. Sarah, uh, Amanda Quick, and the Jane Ann Krentz books, Eloisa James, Tessa Dare. I mean, these are all just great for right now. Yeah. Well, happiness is not, we all need a reminder that we get through it that happiness comes comes even in the darkest time i'm reading the great influenza which <laughs> did come sure it. it did come through it a lot yep. of and, and it's fascinating it's really fascinating kind of social history so but other than that i listen to a lot of books on audio that are comfort reads um for me 
and I don't want to play favorites. So I'll just say that I do spend a lot of time listening to Georgia Hare books. Oh, yes. Um, because I find those the most comforting of all. Yeah. Yes. Well, that brings me to just uh, to quickly mention that we have uh, playlists that are tagged here and um, available uh, also at Hopper Audio and their playlists for Sarah's books and Susan's books. We're very excited now to have um, Susan's audio. So, we, so there are little snippets from, from um, I think there's like five of the books now because we just got these. So, so that's a very cool thing too. You know, um, if it's uh, if it's still tough to get uh, physical books, eBooks and audio books are are just one more path to happiness, as you say, Sarah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, we could we could be here for forever, and I'm fine too. Um, I just I think you know it's just so it's so wonderful to to you know let's face it, you both have been such amazing supporters of libraries. Uh, of you've been to the American Library Association, you've been to so many conferences and so many libraries, and it is it's it's uh, you know I don't know it, you get it. Uh, you've been in, incredibly generous with your time. Um, because you uh, understand the importance of libraries. And I mean, you know, a lot of people can, you know, we all say, oh, I love libraries. No, I mean, then there are, there are you people. There are people just like you two who show up and give these, give of your time and write wonderful speeches and connect with librarians. And I mean, Lainey and I have been to so many shows and you just sit there and watch this connection that's made. It's kind of full circle, you know, and it's pretty cool. Um, I something about libraries. I just have to share a couple favorite, favorite memories. Uh, I grew up in Lancaster, Ohio, and the, the courthouse was where the library was on the second floor, and there were these marble steps, and you'd walk up the marble steps, and they had little dents in the middle, and that is imprinted on my mind because those little dented steps were my gateway to to uh, that library. Uh, and when I, I went back there as an adult, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, it's not a library up there anymore, but those steps are still there and it still smells the same. Mm -hmm. um, our youngest was born at that point, he was just an infant. And then I had a uh, three and a half year old. I remember I was just, just about two weeks postpartum putting that little infant in that in the carrier to get into the library with my three and a half year old. And then um, when, when he got older, when the little one got older, he would run into that library and head for the records. And he was really <laughs> active. He'd, climb, he'd run and try to climb up on the table to get the records. And it got to the point where those wonderful librarians, and this is the Hillsboro Public Library in Hillsboro, New Jersey, the librarians would see me coming in and they would go over to the table and they'd pick up the box of those records and they'd put them on the shelf so that my little one could not get into them. I, those are just precious memories. I mean, I could go on, I had a whole bunch of them. But what a sense of community and anchoring. Our public libraries are our greatest treasure. Public mm -hmm. libraries and our national parks right there. You know, Susan is reminding me of my, I mean, my public library uh, was, aside from being my gateway to romance, it was my gateway to rom to the romance community because an older librarians or people who have been librarians for longer, longer times will maybe remember this, but before the internet, before Goodreads, um, the, because romance readers have always been so voracious, um, the books in the backs of the books, the actual copies of the books on the shelves in my library, there were these sort of wonderful lists of hieroglyphics on the back cover and people would mark the books as they had read them. So for example, you would read Joanna Lindsay, but every Joanna Lindsay title had Fabio on the cover. So it was hard to kind of tell the difference. You would forget which ones you had read and which ones you hadn't. So when you got to the end, you would mark your little mark in pencil or pen, just a tiny little mark, don't deface books, but you know. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then there would be a row of exclamation points at the bottom of that page. And, I get, and that meant like, this was a good one. And so I can remember picking up those books and looking for the ones with the most exclamation points. And this kind of higher, I've talked to librarians about this and, and longer standing librarians do remember these like hieroglyphics in the backs of romance novels, but like what an awesome introduction to a community of readers who, and we didn't know each other. I mean, we, 
we were trusting each other. It was, you know, hive mind romance reviews. And I mean, I will never forget those books the back covers of those books and i still like i'm so grateful for all to all those women who who led the way for me and said read this one read this one (laughs) those now you know if there are any of those books still existed with those marks on them wouldn't it be fun i know somebody says that if you have them in your library yeah yeah if you have them or they're going into your library book sale find me on twitter or facebook I want to buy them from you. That it would be amazing to have some of those in my in my collection. I wanted to um, give a shout out to the place where I le- really learned how to love to read, which was Hiram Halley uh, Library in Pound Ridge, New York. Mm-hmm. Where two years in a row, I won the contest for the most books read over summer vacation. Of course, you did. Markers. I'm so proud. <laughs> children's librarian there named Mrs. Barnes and to this day I can picture her and how great she was. So libraries are just a piece of all of our hearts. Oh that's such a great quote and so true. By the way people are, are <laughs> librarians are saying people we still do this people still do this oh yes people still yay! do this. Andy Wilson. I mean I don't know sure? maybe not yay but. <laughs> librarian friends friends you heard it Sarah wants to buy these, so. Yeah, I'll buy them. I'll buy them from you if you want new ones in your collection. <laughs> How cool is that? That's fantastic. Um, <coughs> but yeah, this, is, this, is, this has been so great. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to forget anything. Susan, you've got your CEPIs, you've got your social media, you've got your Facebook Live, you've got your Instagram. But I stuck at Twitter. You forgot that part. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> I stuck at Twitter too. I love connecting with readers on Facebook. I love co- creating that community there. Instagram is a, has been a wonderful place for me to connect with international readers. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, readers in the U.S. too, but really with international readers. And I have really enjoyed doing that. But my main thing is now I'm sending a, actually regularly sending a newsletter out once a month where I um, share my life, what I'm reading, um, share photos, bad jokes, talk about books. And um, so you can go to my website, SusanElizabethPhillips.com, sign up for that newsletter. You won't get spammed. I'm way too lazy for that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Thank you for that. And Sarah, you've got you've got your fadedmates.net and right. also have your social yeah. media. What do you want? What do you, you know, anything that you all want to make sure we say before we say goodbye, uh, you know. Sure. Um, yeah, well, Faded Mates is the podcast. If you're interested at all in romance and thinking about it in more of a deep dive way, it's a good po- podcast for you. Um, you can subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, that's where I am gracefully furious or elegantly fuming, whatever Entertainment Weekly said. <laughs> that's where I try to be at least. Um, I'm also on Instagram and I love it there. And I post pictures of my dog and, you know, things that I cook and also book recommendations all the time. Mainly if you follow, if you interact with me on social media, you're going to get book recommendations shouted at you most of the time. So that could be fun, right? Absolutely. Um, I'm terrible at Facebook, but I do have, yes, read Dance with me, Dance Away with me. Um, I'm terrible at Facebook, but I do have the Facebook group, which you can find. It's locked down, but if you type in OSRBC, which stands for Old School Romance Book Club, um, you can become a member, and there are a bunch of admins you'll be in within 10 minutes. There are many people. I'm there are many at Facebook than you are, Sarah. You are a hundred percent. I I defer to you. <laughs> Not so good at podcasting, however. <laughs> um, well, we all have our strengths, and both of you have the strength of being amazing writers and connecting with readers and uh, and and showing your love for librarians and in, in the library world every chance that every time we ask, you say yes, and that is great. Anytime. I know it. I mean, 
I, I'm not saying anything that's not true. Also, lots of OSRBC people are chiming in over here. So they're, they're all watching. Lainey, do you, do somebody you put a link in comments. <laughs> somebody put a link in comments? They, somebody will. They, somebody they'll will. do what I tell them. <laughs> They love the dented steps, Susan. Guys. Dog eared little marks. <laughs> I mean, we're good. Um, let's put the, let's show the jackets, uh, Lainey, could we? So one more time. Um, we have um, Sarah McLean's Daring and the Duke, which is going on. Can I just add this model was Miss New York in the Miss America pageant. Really? That book yeah. is coming on June 30th. Is that right, Sarah? That goes on sale June, June 30th. 30th. Okay. June 30th. And I believe her name is April Markashek, and she was Miss New York. So wow. great job, April. <laughs> Very nice. That's that, I love that sort of stuff. Jackets are so interesting, aren't they? I love I love everything about book jackets and what goes into book jackets. And, and in fact, several people commented on how much they love the book jackets. Now, um, next, Lainey. Ms. Susan Elizabeth Phillips, Dance Away With Me, on sale June 9th. And those, uh, um, those leaves were once Miss Vermont. I <laughs> have <laughs> <laughs> nothing more to say. Lost total control of this Zoom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both <laughs> for coming on and, and spending you. time with, with everyone and for sharing your insights and your, your heart and your love for, for, for books, for readers, for the library world, and just for everything that you do. And Carrie, thank you for coming on and just you know sharing this really unique relationship that we all, not a lot of us get to see. So it's really interesting to, hear the three of you talk to sit back and watch this because it's a, it's a working relationship and it's been working really well for all of you for a long time. Virginia, thank you both. Maybe thank you guys. Thanks for watching everyone. Yes. So uh, information about both books is on the site and the audio playlist. So you can go and check that out too. Go to their Facebook page and Twitter, go to the Twitter. Not Susan. <laughs> go to Susan's Twitter. <laughs> but sign up for my newsletter. And a newsletter. Yeah. That's chock full. That is a cool newsletter. So take good care all and thank you again. Yeah, be right. safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.